Hi, Grandma here. I'm reading Cheaper by the Dozen. Uh, chapter 15, um, beginning, uh, which is called Gilbreth and Company, beginning on 155. Um, Aunt Anne, uh, their father's sister, sometimes comes and stays with them when their parents are on tours. And uh, that's what this, um, a lot of this chapter is about. Um, and she's having a hard time keeping control of 12 kids. Uh, so we continue on 155 uh, at the top of the page. It was at the dinner table that something finally snapped in Aunt Anne. We had spent the entire meal purposely making things miserable for her. Bill had hidden under the table and we'd removed his place and chair so she wouldn't realize he was missing. While we ate, Bill thumped Aunt Anne's legs with the side of his hand. Who's kicking me, she complained. Saints alive, we said no one. Well, you don't have a dog, do you? We didn't, and we told her so. Our collie had died some time before. Well, somebody's certainly kicking me hard. She insisted that the child sitting on each side of her slide his chair toward the head of the table so that no legs could possibly reach her. Bill thumped again. Somebody is kicking me, Aunt Anne said, and I intend to get to the bottom of it, literally. Bill thumped again. Aunt Anne picked up the tablecloth, looked under the table, but Bill had anticipated her and retreated to the under the end. The table was so long you couldn't see that far underneath without getting down on your hands and knees. And Aunt Anne was much too dignified to stoop to such level. When she put the tablecloth down again, Bill crawled forward and licked her hand. You do too have a dog, Aunt Anne said accusingly while she dried her hand on a napkin. Speak up now, who brought the miserable cur into the house? Bill thumped again and retreated. She picked up the tablecloth and looked. She put it down again and he licked her hand. She looked again and then dangled her hand temptingly between her knees. Bill couldn't resist this trap and this time Aunt Anne was ready for him. When he started to lick, she snapped her knees together like a vice, trapped his head in the folds of her skirt, reached down and grabbed him by the hair. Come out of there, you scamp, you, she shouted. I've got you. You can't get away this time. Come out, I say. She didn't give Bill a chance to come out on his own power. She yanked, and he came out by the hair on his head, screaming and kicking. In those days, Bill was not a snappy dresser. He liked old clothes, preferably held together with safety pins and held up by old neckties. When he wore a necktie around his neck, which was seldom as possible, he sometimes evened up the ends by trimming the longer one with a pair of scissors. His knickers usually were partially unbuttoned in the front, what the Navy calls the Commodore's privilege. They were completely unfastened at the legs, hung, hanging down to his ankles. During the course of a day, his stockings rode gradually down his legs and by dinner had partially disappeared into his sneakers. When mother was home, she made him wear such appurtenances as a coat and a belt, meaning um, things that accompany what you wear. In her absence, he had grown slack. When Aunt Anne jerked him out, a piece of string connecting a buttonhole in his shirt with a buttonhole in the front of his trousers suddenly broke. Bill grabbed for his pants, but it was too late. Go to your room, you scamp you, Aunt Anne said, shaking him. Just wait until your father comes home. He'll know how to take care of you. Bill picked up his knickers and did as he was told. He had a new respect for Aunt Anne, and the whole top of his head was smarting from the hair pulling. Aunt Anne sat down with deceptive calm and gave us a disarming smile. I want you children to listen carefully to me, she almost whispered. There's not a living soul here, including the baby, who is cooperative. I've never seen a more spoiled crowd of children. As she went on, her voice grew louder, much louder, 
Tom Greaves opened the pantry door a crack and peeked in. For those of you who like to believe that an only child is a selfish child, let me say you are 100% wrong. From what I've seen, this is the most completely selfish household in the entire world. She was roaring now, wide open, and it was the first time we had ever seen her that way. Except that her voice was an octave higher, it might have been Dad, sitting there in his own chair. From this moment on, pipe down. Every last one of you are, I'll lambast the hides off you. I'll fix you so you can't sit down for a month. Do you understand? Does everybody understand? In case you don't realize it, I've had enough. With that, determined to show us she wasn't going to let us spoil her meal, she put a piece of pie in her mouth. But she was so upset that she choked and slowly she turned a deep purple. She clutched at her throat. We were afraid she was dying and we were ashamed of ourselves. Tom, watching at the door, saw his duty. Putting aside his fear of her, he ran into the dining room and slapped her on the back. Then he grabbed her arms and held them high over her head. You'll be all right in a minute, Aunt Anne, he said. His system worked. She gurgled and finally caught her breath. Then remembering her dignity, she jerked her arms out of his hands, drew herself up to her full height. Keep your hands to yourselves, Greaves, she said in a tone that indicated her belief that his next step would be to loosen her corset. Don't ever let me hear you make the fatal mistake of calling me Aunt Anne again. And after this, mind your own, she looked around the table and then decided to say it anyway, your own damn business. There was no doubt about that who was boss, and Aunt Anne had no further trouble from us. When Dad and Mother returned home, all of us expected to be disciplined, but we had misjudged Aunt Anne. You look like you've lost weight, Dad said to her. The children didn't give you any trouble, did they? Not a bit, said Aunt Anne. They behaved beautifully once we got to understand each other. We got along just fine, didn't we, children? She reached out fondly, rumpled Billy's hair, which didn't need rumpling. Ouch! Billy whispered to her, grinning in relief. It still hurts. Have a heart. We had better success with another guest whom we set out deliberately to discourage. She was a woman psychologist who came to Montclair every fortnight from New York to give us intelligence tests. It was her own idea, not dad's or mother's, but they welcomed her. She was planning to publish a paper about the effects of dad's teaching methods on our IQs, intelligent quotients. She was thin and sallow with angular features and a black mustache, not quite droopy enough to hide a horsey set of upper teeth. We hated her and suspected the feeling was mutual. At first, her questions were legitimate enough, arithmetic, spelling, languages, geography, and the sort of purposeful confusion about ringing numbers and underlining words in which some psychologists place particular store. After we completed the initial series of tests, she took us one by one into the parlor for a personal interview. Even mother and dad weren't allowed to be present. The interviews were embarrassing and insulting. Does it hurt when your mother spanks you? She asked each of us, peering searchingly into our eyes and breathing into our faces. You mean your mother never spanks you? She seemed disappointed. Well, how about your father? Oh, he does. That appeared to be heartening news. Does your mother pay more attention to the other children than she does you? How many baths do you take a week? Are you sure? Do you think it would be nice to have still another baby brother? You do? Goodness. We decided that if dad and mother knew the kinds of questions we were being asked, they wouldn't like them any better than we did. Anne and Ernestine had made up their minds to explain the situation to them. And when destiny delivered the psychologist into our hands, lock, stock, and mustache. Mother had been devising a series of job aptitude tests and the desk on her bed was piled with pamphlets and magazines on psychology. 
Ernestine was running idly through them one night, and while Mother was reading to us from the five little peppers and how they grew, when she came across a batch of intelligence tests. One of them was the test which the New York woman was in the process of giving us. Not the embarrassing personal questions, but the business of circling numbers, spelling, and filling in blanks. The correct answers were in black. Snake's hips, Ernestine crowed. Got it! Mother looked up absently from her book. Don't mix up my work, Ernie, she said. What are you after? Just want to borrow something, Ern told her. Well, don't forget to put it back where you thought you, where you, when you were through with it. Now, where was I? Oh, I remember. Joel had just said it's not necessary. If necessary, he could support the family by selling papers and shining shoes down at the depot. She resumed her reading. The psychologist had already given us the first third of the test. Now, Anne and Ernestine tutored us all on the second third until we could run right down a page, fill in the answers without even reading the questions. The last third was an oral word association test and they coaxed us on that too. We are going to be the smartest people she ever gave a test to, Ern told us, and the queerest too. Make her think we're smart but uncivilized because we haven't had enough individual attention. That's what she wants to think anyway. Act nervous and queer, Anne said. While she's talking to you, fidget, scratch yourself. Be as nasty as you can. That won't require much effort for most of you. There's no need on our tutoring you on that. The next time the psychologist came from New York, she sat us at intervals around the walls of the parlor with books on our laps to write on. She passed each of us a copy of the second third of the test. When I say commence, work as quickly as you can, she told us. You have half an hour and I want you to get as far along in the test as you can. If any of you should happen to finish before the time is up, bring the papers up to me. She looked at her watch. Ready. Now turn your papers over and start. Remember, I'm watching you, so don't try to look at your neighbor's paper. We ran down the pages, filling in the blanks. The older children turned in their papers within 10 minutes. Lillian, the youngest being examined, finally turned hers in within 20. The psychologist looked at Lillian's paper and her mouth dropped open. How old are you, dearie? She asked. Six, said Lil. I'll be seven in June. There's something radically wrong here, the visitor said. I haven't had a chance to grade all your papers, but do you know you have a higher IQ than Nicholas Murray Butler? I read a lot. Lil said. The psychologist glanced at the other tests and she shook her head. I don't know what to think, she sighed. You've certainly shown remarkable improvement in the last two weeks. Maybe we'd better get on to the last third of the test. I'm going to go around the room and say a word to each of you. I want you to answer instantly the first word that comes into your mind. Now, won't that be a nice little game? Anne twitched. Ernestine scratched, Martha bit her fingers. We'll go by ages, the visitor continued, Anne first. She pointed to Anne. Knife, said the psychologist. Stab, wound, bleed, slit throat, murder, disembowel, scream, shriek, replied Anne without taking out a breath. And so fast that the words flowed together. Jesus, said the psychologist. Let me get that down. You're just supposed to answer one word, but let me get it all down anyway. She panted in excitement as she scribbled in her pad. All right, Ernestine, your turn. Just one word. Black. Jack, said Ernestine. The visitor looked at Martha. Foot. Kick. Said Martha. Hair. Louse, said Frank. Flower. Stink said Bill. The psychologist was becoming more and more excited. She looked at Lil. Droppings, said Lil, upsetting the apple cart. But I didn't ask you your word yet, the visitor exclaimed. So that's it. Let me see what your word was going to be. I thought so. Your word was bird. 
and they told you to say droppings, didn't they? Lil nodded sheepishly. And they told you how to fill in the rest of the test, didn't they? I suppose the answers were given to you by, my, by your mother, so you would impress me with how smart you are. We started to snicker and then to roar, but the psychologist didn't think it was funny. You're all nasty little cheats, she said. Don't think for a minute you pulled the wool over my eyes. I saw through you from the start. She picked up her wrap, started for the front door. Dad had heard us laughing, came out of his office to see what was going on. If there was any excitement, he wanted to be part of it. Well, he beamed, it sounds as if it's been a jelly test running along so soon. Tell me frankly, what do you think of my family? She looked at us and there was an evil glint in her eye. I'm glad you asked that, she whinnied. Unquestionably, they are smart. Too damn smart for their britches. Does that answer your question? As to whether they were aided and abetted in an attempted fraud, I cannot say. But my professional advice is to bear down on them. A good thrashing right now from the oldest to the youngest might be just the thing. She slammed the front door and Dad looked glumly at us. All right, he sighed. What have you been up to? That woman's going to write a paper on the family. What did you do to her? Anne twitched, Ernestine scratched, Martha bit her nails. Dad was getting angry. Hold still and speak up, no nonsense. Do you want a baby brother? Anne asked. Does it hurt when your mother spanks you? Said Ernestine. When did you have your last bath? Martha inquired. Are you sure? Hmm. Dad raised his hands in surrender and shook his head. He looked old and tired now. Sometimes I don't know if it's worth it, he said. Why didn't you come and tell your mother and me about it if she was asking questions like that? Oh, well, on the other hand, why that bearded goat? Dad started to smile. If she writes a paper about any of that, I'll sue her for everything she owns, including her birth certificate if she has one. He opened the door into his office. Come in and give me all the frightful details. After you, Dr. Butler, Ernestine told Lil. A few minutes later, Mother came into the office where we were perched on the edges of her and Dad's desks. The stenographers had abandoned their typewriters and were crowded around us. What's the commotion, Frank? She asked Dad. I could hear you bellowing all the way up to the attic. Oh, Lord, Dad wheezed. Start at the beginning, kids. I want your mother to hear all this. That bearded old goat. Not you, Lily. Okay. Our next chapter will be Over the Hill. Now, that's another one that has multiple meanings. Does it mean they were running over the hill or maybe taking the car over the hill? Or does it mean that dad is beginning to feel over the hill, meaning he is starting to get be tired? What do you think it is? Well, we'll see you in the next chapter. Bye-bye.